Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all to the webinar on introduction to the principle of AFM. My name is I am application scientist in India for part AFM. And uh, let me just you know give you an overview on how an AFM actually works. This is going to be my outline of the talk. So I'm going to talk about uh, what is AFM. I'm going to talk about some history, uh, some basic principles, which are the AFM different parts. Then I'm going to focus a little more on the imaging modes. And uh, I will show you some of the you know, representative AFM images taken by these modes. And then we will summarize the entire talk. So here is a quick history uh, for you. Uh, scanning probe microscopy, uh, which is SPM, is not only at the top of the list of equipment pioneering the nanoscale world, it is also the most fundamental technology. Uh, what I feel is subsequent to the you know, first generation of, let's say, optical microscopes, then you had second generation of uh, uh, electron microscopes. Right? So I feel that you know scanning probe microscopy or SPM uh, you know, has has every right to be recognized as third generation of microscopes, uh, as it enables the users and you know uh, people to have glimpse of this nanoscale world. So this uh, SPM originated with the invention of uh, something called a scanning tunneling microscope, which is STM. Uh, what does STM do? Okay, STM uses a tunneling current between the probe and the tip, uh, probe and the sample. In, in a vacuum state to measure the surface topography. Now, the only limitation with STM is that we can, you know, uh, you know, we can use the samples which are conductors or, you know, which are which are semiconductors. So there was a need to, uh, you know, invent an instrument which could also measure sample topography uh, of these non-conducting uh, materials. And thus, uh, atomic force microscopy was born. So, what we have here is, uh, you know, the, the picture of Professor Quaid. Uh, he was one of the inventors of uh, atomic force microscope, uh, along with Benning and Gerber. And uh, the first AFM was born in, at Stanford University in, in 1985. Right. Um, the right hand, the right hand side figure uh, of the person is of Dr. Park, who uh, was student of uh, Professor Quaid and later on he uh, went on to you know found his own first AFM company uh, now Park Systems. So this is the you know complete SPM family uh, that we have so scanning probe microscopy is like a big umbrella under which you have a scanning tunneling microscope uh, and then you have atomic force microscope uh, Atomic force microscope then has got a lot of different, uh, you know, basic and advanced modes like uh, uh, EFM, KPFM, uh, uh, conductive AFM, uh, scanning uh, capacitance microscopy, which is SCM, LFM, so on and so forth. But today uh, we will, you know, focus more on the basics of, you know, how to generate an image using atomic force microscope. So here is my first question to everybody. Uh, and, and the question is how an AFM actually generate an image. Okay, so because you know we are since we are looking at the basics of AFM, uh, we should you know, always ask ourselves this question: How does an AFM generate an image? And the simplest answer that you know I can give you is that uh, AFM generates images by you know just feeling the sample surface. Right. So on on the left hand side, you know, I'll just put on my pointer. On the left hand side, you can see an image of a tip, okay, and a, and a cantilever, right? So, um, the surface, okay, and then and we find that, you know, this uh, uh, tip of this AFM actually feels the sample surface and it actually generates an image, okay, very much uh, similar to a visually impaired person or a person with a low uh, uh, vision. Okay, how he feels this braille tactile, you know, writing uh, on the, on the paper. Okay, if I have to give you the analogy. Right. So uh, 
the right bottom image is of an actual AFM uh, tip and a cantilever. So you can see, you know, how small that AFM tip is. If you had happen to measure the radius of this AFM tip right here, okay, then it will be few, uh, you know, few nanometers or few uh, tens of nanometers. Right. So AFM is not, uh, you know, like a typical optical microscope, okay, but it is, it is more like a, a probing robot, okay, and, and it actually feels the sample surface uh, to, to, you know, give you an image of the sample. So the next question which I want to ask is, uh, what does the AFM tip feel? Okay, and then, and this is also a very uh, important question that we need to ask. Right? Again, in a very simple uh, word, okay, you may say that you know the, the tip, you know, feels the sample surface, right? But if we you know go a little deep uh, and uh, understand that this AFM tip is uh, nothing but it is you know it's just made up of atoms right it's, it's made up of atoms and um, uh, even the sample surface is nothing but you know it has got atoms right so um, uh, when the tip comes close to the sample surface right uh, there is a tip sample interaction which takes place right? and what we want to know is what is this tip sample interaction? Right? Now, one thing which you must have already guessed is that you know, uh, you know, whenever you talk about the uh, talk about atomic force microscope, uh, the name always involves force, right? Uh, and this indicates something, okay? And what does it indicate? It indicates that whenever the tip or the tip atoms, you know, start to interact with the sample surface or sample atoms, right? There is some force that is involved. So we need to now, you know, check, you know, what exactly are these forces between the uh, AFM tip and your sample surface. So there is this another question to you. You know, what are these forces on the AFM tip? Uh, to this question, what we do is, you know, let us just take uh, one of the tip atom and one of the sample atom, right? And then uh, suppose, you know, these two atoms initially they are very far away from each other. What we are going to do is we are going to slowly going to slowly bring this uh, tip atom close to the sample atom, and we will see. Uh, what happens? So as the tip atom you know, comes close to this, uh, uh, close to this uh, uh, sample atom, uh, their separation distance decreases, right? And the probability of uh, interaction uh, between these two atoms increase, right? And uh, as these atoms come closer and closer together, their bonding potential energy okay, is going to decrease from zero to a negative value, okay. So at this first point, uh, you know, the atoms are very far away. So let me just bring them a little closer, okay. And as they come closer, you will find that, uh, you know, these atoms, they start to uh, interact with each other. And then there is certainly long range attractive force on these atoms. What if I bring these atoms still more closer? Okay, so that this uh, at, at point number three, okay, the atoms are now very close to each other. Right? So if you bring these atoms very, very close to each other, what happens is that uh, uh, you know these two atoms they will experience uh, a repulsive force now. Okay, at this at this third uh, image, right, and their bonding potential energy okay is going to rapidly increase. Okay, as these atoms come still further close together. Now, these interactions okay, between these two atoms, okay, as they slowly come closer together, okay, where their attractive, uh, you know, force, long-range attractive forces increase, okay, their their uh, you know bonding potential energy you know, goes a negative value, and as you bring them still closer together, okay, suddenly you will find that you know they, their their uh, repulsive forces increase. So what we need to do is, you know, we need to, uh, you know, model these interactions. And uh, 
this interaction of atoms we can be very easily modeled using this leonard jose potential right so here what we find is that you know at this uh, point number one these atoms are very far with respect to each other okay but as these atoms slowly start to come closer and closer okay where we are decreasing the distance between the two atoms okay their long range attractive forces increase okay and uh, their their bonding potential energy uh, decreases and then we have, we have this at point 2 where you you find that these atoms are under uh, long range attractive forces interaction but uh, as you still bring these atoms closer and closer and more closer together then you then then one finds that suddenly uh, now the repulsive forces increase at this point number 3 and uh, uh, you will find that those two atoms are under uh, you know a, a repulsive force interaction so these forces are nothing but uh, you know your van der waals forces and uh, whenever the tip interacts with the sample surface okay generally uh, you know we we always deal with these van der waals forces now the question is uh, you know what happens to the tip right and uh, secondly you know uh, we, we know that you know in the in the image the tip was actually mounted onto the cantilever right so what is the role of that cantilever as well so what we find is that whenever you know the tip uh, experiences this attractive forces or this repulsive forces uh, the cantilever actually bends okay so this is what i want to show you uh, where at this point number 2 when these uh, atoms are close enough and they have they are into this long range attractive force you know the, the the cantilever bends in one direction okay but uh, if these atoms are very close together the the tip and the sample atom then you know they they experience a short range repulsive force and then you will find that you know the cantilever is actually going to bend in this other direction apart from uh, apart from the van der waals uh, forces the tip uh, can also experience different interaction forces like it can experience uh, uh, electrostatic force magnetic force it can experience some capillary forces it can also experience some uh, frictional forces etc now in order to generate an image in an afm uh, only uh, the tip and the cantilever is uh, is you know along with the tip and the cantilever we also need other key parts of the system right so what are those key parts you will find that uh, you know you have this cantilever right here and then there is a tip at the bottom then you have this laser source and this laser source you know falls on this cantilever and reflects into something called as pspd which is called as a photosensitive uh, uh, position detector then we have this z scanner on which you have this cantilever uh, that is mounted and the sample is mounted on this x y scanner right so this x y scanner is going to move the sample in the x and y direction and the z scanner is going to move the cantilever in the vertical direction now very quickly we can you know uh, look at what is the role of this uh, uh, pspd and you know eventually what is the role of this z scanner as well okay uh, for generating the image now along with all these key parts you should also remember that uh, uh, AFM also comes with uh, very high end electronics in its uh, controller and uh, its own feedback mechanism to generate an image. This is uh, this is the head of the AFM right here and you'll find that the photosensitive position detector, the laser, all right, uh, and, and the Z scanner all fit into this AFM head and you'll find that you know the cantilever is right here. Right? so what we generally do is we you know align this uh, laser onto this cantilever if you, if you have to take a look at this bottom right image then you know we have we align the laser onto this cantilever and this laser then gets reflected into this photosensitive position detector okay the image on the bottom left right and we always like to keep uh, this laser spot centered you know between these four quadrants a b c and d right so uh, we will see why that why that is uh, why that is important. okay so now here is a picture right where uh, where we have aligned this uh, 
laser spot exactly at the center of this four quadrant position detector right here, right? Now, uh, what we generally do is, you know, we align this laser into this photo detector at the center, okay? And we do that when the tip is not interacting with the sample. Okay? That means the tip is freely, you know, free in air, right? And then we, we align this uh, laser onto this photo detector exactly at the center. So that is important, okay, because this laser spot is going to move up and down. Okay, so as the as the cantilever is going to bend, this laser spot is going to move up and down. Okay, now this vertical motion, okay, is going to give you the topographic information of the sample. Okay, and this lateral motion of the of the laser spot is going to give you, let's say, the lateral information or let's say the frictional information of your sample surface right more generally we are interested in you know what is the topographic information okay why you know when, when the when the laser spot moves you know up and down in that position uh PSPD. the question is uh does the afm you know just take a photograph using the cantilever or does it actually scan the sample right? and the answer is the tip actually goes back and forth on, on a rectangular specimen area in something called as your raster scan pattern, right? And uh, it generates an image of that entire area of the sample under consideration. Okay, so this is something called as a raster scan pattern. So the AFM doesn't, you know, kind of let's say click a photograph, okay, using a tip, but it actually physically scans the sample. Or to generate an image. So let's uh, you know quickly uh, try to understand uh, how is the mechanism to generate that image. Right. So what I've done is you know if, if you have to take a look at this first image, then uh, that the laser is being aligned into the uh, photodiode exactly at the center of the photodiode, and then there is no tip sample interaction that is taking place. Okay. Now what I do is. I slowly, you know, land the tip on the sample. And the moment I land the tip on the sample, you'll find that the tip actually bends and the laser spot, you know, instead of hitting at the center, it deviates slightly in the vertical direction, right? This is the point where I, you know, this is the value, which is nothing but, you know, we call it as a set point. Right. So let's keep this word in, 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 uh, in your mind and we'll come to that a little later. At this third image, you know, if, if uh, a sample has got some hill-like structure, then, you know, if the, if the tip goes on that hill-like structure, then the tip is going to bend even further and the laser spot is going to, you know, move vertically even further up. Similarly, you know, at this image number four, if you have got some, uh, some you know, valley-like structure in your uh, in your sample, then you know the laser actually might go to the bottom of that uh, photosensitive detail. Right? The question is, how do we really generate this image, okay, off of your sample surface? And to answer that, you know, we have got something called that this feedback mechanism of the atomic force microscope. Right. So, what does this feedback mechanism does? Okay, this feedback mechanism. Is always going to check this set point that you know we, we prescribe to the system, right? So let's say you know this is at one volt. Okay, let's let's say this is at one volt. So you know I, I'm prescribing the system that you engage your tip on the sample at one volt. Okay. Now the moment this tip is going to see a bump, okay, and the laser is going to bend a little further, let's say two volts, it's going to bend two volts, okay? Then the system is going to send a feedback mechanism and the feedback mechanism then tells this Z scanner on which, you know, the, the cantilever and the tip is, you know, attached. It is going to tell that uh, a Z scanner to slightly move up, okay? And why it is moving up? It is moving up because it needs to, uh, you know, come to come back to the set point which is set at one point. Okay. Similarly, uh, 
you know, the moment the tip sees a valley and it and the laser spot goes below, uh, you know, that one gold set point, the feedback mechanism again is going to tell the scanner to, you know, uh, move down slightly so that the laser spot again hits one gold, which is your set point. Okay. So what happens here is that in this photosensitive detector, there is always some error that takes place as the tip scans your sample surface. And what does this uh, feedback mechanism does? The feedback mechanism always tries to, you know, eliminate that error, you know, tries to make that error zero always at every point where the tip is scanning your sample surface. Okay, so um, by moving the scanner, you know, continuously up and down, depending upon what is the error here, okay, uh, you start to actually generate an image of the sample surface. So the image that you get is nothing but it's actually the Z height or, you know, how much the Z scanner has moved at every point or at every pixel in your, you know, sample surface or, or in your, uh, you know, uh, image itself. So having you know a basic understanding of this feedback mechanism, uh, I would like to quickly uh, go on to the imaging modes of the AFM. So basically, there are three modes of uh, uh, you know uh, imaging in an AFM. One is something called as a contact mode. One is called as a non-contact mode, and the third one is uh, you know called as intermittent contact or uh, tapping mode. In contact mode uh, operation, the AFM Tip or cantilever is, you know, in contact with the sample surface. Okay, so if you happen to see this middle image, then the tip actually, you know, touches the sample surface. Okay. So in contact mode, what we, uh, you know, generally like to do is we generally like to specify what is the set point, okay, of the tip that is getting, you know, deflected and, and the and the laser spot that is getting into that photosensitive position detector. Then we talk about the error signal. Right, uh, and the error signal is always the thing, but we try to eliminate that error uh, signal uh, from the PSPD, and we always try to maintain the set point. And how we do that? We do that using the feedback mechanism. Okay, so in contact mode, the system always tries, you know, to make this uh, uh, error signal value zero here using the Z scanner. Okay? And in this linear Jones potential, you always find that you know. Uh, the, 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 the tip or the cantilever is always in this repulsive regime right here, okay, in, in this uh, right hand side. So now let us take a look at uh, how does the tip really tracks the sample surface, okay, in, in contact mode, right. So what do we do first is, you know, we align this laser into this PSPD detector, right, and exactly at the center. Okay, when the tip is not interacting with the sample or, the, or when the tip is in the air. Okay. Now what we do is we, we land the tip onto the sample and the cantilever bends. And because of this bending of the cantilever, instead of the laser, you know, hitting the center of the photo detector, right, the, the, there is some uh, you know, vertical movement of that uh, laser spot that we can see in this image right here. Now, as the tip starts to track the sample, okay, as the tip tracks to, starts to track the sample surface, okay, what we find is that if the tip encounters some hilly region, okay, or, or some height, right, then the tip is going to bend even further, okay, so let's say, you know, from 5 nanometer, the tip is bent to 7 nanometer. But what is our set point? Our set point is 5 nanometer. So how much is the error in the measurement? The error is, the measurement is somewhere around 2 nanometer. So that error signal, you know, is, is sent back as a feedback mechanism. And, you know, the system tells the Z scanner to slightly move up. Okay, so that the error becomes zero. And you know the tip is able to scan that particular uh, feature of your sample. Right? Now, similarly, uh, as the tip you know goes further ahead, 
right? The tip right here in this position, it suddenly doesn't feel any uh, surface, okay? Or it feels like there is a valley kind of a portion right here. And then you will find that, you know, the, the cantilever, uh, uh, you know, doesn't bend so much. So it's just at, let's say, three nanometer. Okay. So now what happens here is that, again, there is an error signal that takes place. So how much is that error signal? The error signal is three nanometer minus five nanometer because five nanometer, let's say, is our set point. Okay. So how much is the difference? The difference is minus two right here. Okay. And uh, the moment the signal is minus two, okay, the feedback mechanism is now going to tell that particular uh, Z scanner to slightly move down so that, you know, uh, the set point of five nanometer is always maintained. Okay. So if you happen to take a look at this red line, then this red line is nothing but it is actually the, uh, you know, position of that Z scanner that has moved up or down okay uh, depending upon what was that error signal and in order to eliminate that error signal uh, uh, the feedback mechanism you know uh, you know drove that z, z scanner slightly up or slightly down and this is how uh, you know an image in contact mode is uh, generated at every point of your sample surface uh, so now very quickly uh, coming to the second mode of operation, which is called as a non-contact mode. But in non-contact mode, what we do is we vibrate the tip, right? And uh, we vibrate or oscillate the cantilever at very, very high frequencies, right? Okay. And then what we do is we then slowly try to bring the vibrating tip close to the sample. Okay. So here, okay, this, you know, this red, uh, sinusoidal wave, you know, is, is something like the vibrating cantilever in air, okay, at its resonant frequency. But what we then do is, you know, we, we slowly bring this uh, particular cantilever vibrating uh, closer to the sample. And as, as the cantilever comes closer to the sample, the cantilever is going to start to interact with the sample, right, in its long range attractive forces, okay. And because of that, its amplitude is going to fall down. Its amplitude is going to decrease a little bit. Okay. So whenever uh, the, the cantilever tries to come closer to the surface, you'll find that you know the amplitude changes or the amplitude decreases. Right. In general, the spring constant of the cantilever changes or decreases. Okay. Along with that, even the resonant frequency changes. So in non-contact mode. What we do is we do not physically touch the sample. Okay, we, we are somewhere between one to ten nanometers from the sample surface. And what are we looking at? We are looking at you know what is the change of the amplitude of that vibrating tip. And this change of the vibrate, this change of the amplitude, you know, is uh, uh, is is, uh, is is put up as a set point. Okay, very much similar to the contact mode, and uh, you start to you know, Kind of generate an image because as the scanner moves up and down, the amplitude is going to change. Okay. What we generally find is that uh, in uh, your non contact mode, the, the cantilever is in this attractive force regime, okay, the long range attractive force regime right here. Right? And then in this, in this blue image, what we find is that uh, you know the, the, the cantilever is actually just above the sample surface just just couple of nanometers above the surface and it is actually tracking that that surface so depending upon you know what is that uh, change in the amplitude you are actually able to uh, then generate <coughs> that particular you know, image of your sample surface uh, this is the you know a, a quick schematic diagram of you know what happens uh, in your non contact all right so whenever there is a change of amplitude you know, of your cantilever, the feedback mechanism tells that Z scanner to move slightly up or slightly down, okay, to maintain the set point amplitude that you know we have given to that particular, uh, you know, to that particular tip or the cantilever itself. Uh, so this is a quick visualization of what is happening uh, to that particular uh, cantilever. 
So the, the first figure is, you know, the, the, uh, uh, it's a free amplitude in air, okay, at its resonant frequency. Let's say that the amplitude is, let's say, around 9 nanometers. Okay. But, but now as you bring the cantilever close to the sample surface, but not touching the sample surface, okay, uh, you'll find that the, the amplitude goes on decreasing. Let's say in this case, the amplitude is 5 nanometers. And then I tell the system, uh, you know, to set this value as a set point. Okay, so this is acting like a reference point to that particular uh, feedback mechanism of your sample surface. Right. So now, as the tip goes and you know scans the sample surface, if the tip uh, you know feels a valley like ocean, you'll find that you know the 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 distance between the tip and the sample increases. If the distance between the tip and the sample increases, you'll find that the amplitude of that tip or the cantilever increases and this tells the uh, you know feedback mechanism okay uh, the, the 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 g scanner to slightly move this cantilever a little lower so that this 5 nanometer set point can be maintained right similarly you know as the tip scans this valley and, and and it encounters a hilly area or hill type region right here okay then the distance between the cantilever and the sample okay becomes very very close and because of that the amplitude becomes very small okay as the interaction forces increase a lot now the feedback mechanism you know then tells that z scanner to move slightly up okay so that this 5 nanometer set point can be maintained and the tip can actually track the sample set okay so depending upon you know uh, what are the features of your sample surface the z scanner is either going to move up and down and it is always going to adjust the tip in in such a way that the set point amplitude of let's say 5 nanometers is always maintained and this is how you know you actually generate the image of your sample surface okay the third uh, you know very quickly the, the, the third um, uh, imaging mode is your intermittent or Tapping mode, right? And it's it's a dynamic uh, uh, AFM technique uh, where you know you actually scan your sample surface, okay? Uh, and this technique is again similar to your you know non-contact mode itself. The only difference is that you know uh, the tip is actually tapping the sample surface at a particular amplitude at which it is vibrating, okay? Uh, so there are you know some advantages and some disadvantages uh, to to this uh, to this uh, to this imaging mode. Okay, what we can do is uh, using tapping mode, uh, we can actually uh, determine the different uh, materials that are present uh, or, or contrast can be uh, generated uh, using tapping mode, uh, where we can distinguish between let's say the two different materials on your sample surface. Uh, but tapping mode has got its own uh, disadvantages as well. Okay, uh, what we what happens is that you know as the tip scans the sample surface, it is actually tapping, and uh, there is high possibility possibility that you know the, the, the tip can actually wear out uh, at a higher rate. Okay, as compared to you know Park's non-contact mode, where the tip is actually not touching the sample surface, but it is you know slightly above the sample surface. So it's it's uh, uh, you know uh, the, the non-contact mode gives you really high resolution and almost negligible tip wear and it's completely uh, non-destructive tip sample interface. this is one image which i wanted to show you uh, that you know how the tip blunting takes place right and uh, how it affects the roughness so you know initially you'll find that you know the tip properly scans the sample surface in tapping mode okay but but eventually as the tip becomes blunt or the radius of the tip goes on increasing it might not track the sample features uh, you know in, in, in much depth if the tip becomes more blunt then you know you actually start to lose the resolution of your sample surface so as the tip sharpness decreases okay you are uh, uh, you know find that you start to get these you know more uh, low resolution blunt images so this is what you know is a is a comparison of uh, the, the non-contact mode to the tapping mode images. So in, in tapping mode, you know, images you will find that uh, 
as you go from the first scan to the tenth scan of the sample, okay, the the, the sharpness of that image uh, uh, goes down as the tip becomes more and more black. It's not able to track the surface uh, features uh, properly. But uh, in in non-contact mode, you'll find that you know even if you have done let's say hundred scans, okay, the the image sharpness uh, and and the resolution of that image is is is, is maintained. So now, uh, you know, with this understanding, I want to you know, quickly uh, show you the image uh, uh, gallery where you know different images have taken in different uh, modes. So what we what we really find is that you know this is an image of uh, gallium phosphide uh, taken using non-contact mode. You know these are some of the defects that we find on a reflex lens has been taken on you know non-contact mode. Uh, this is some polymer uh, ceramic composite. And you know, this image is taken in tapping mode, where you can see the height image uh, as well as you know a phase image, which gives you the contrast between the polymer and the ceramic material. Uh, this is uh, some uh, ITO glass slide, okay, uh, taken at some uh, high resolution image in non-contact mode. Uh, this is a uh, uh, image of PZT thin film, and uh, what we actually find in PZT thin film are the electrical. Uh, Domain structures, and this actually is done in something called as a piezoelectric force microscopy or DC EFM mode. Okay, but uh, this PFM mode is, uh, you know, is actually performed using contact mode. So the height image that you see on the left hand side, which is this one, is actually nothing but it's it's a contact mode image. Then we can, you know, see some graphene on boron nitride using non-contact uh, imaging. Uh, some uh, uh, polystyrene and uh, LDP uh, composite uh, material using uh, tapping mode, and of course you can also always do uh, you know, you know, some biology work. So this is some plasmid DNA uh, images that have been taken using uh, non-contact mode. So in uh, summary, okay, uh, we we just discussed about you know how an image is generated using uh, AFM. Uh, using these three modes. So the contact mode is the simplest way to acquire the sample topography. And uh, you know generally uh, you actually bend the cantilever um, uh, to generate the image on the sample surface. Okay, and then since it is a physical uh, you know touching of the sample surface, generally uh, we, we don't image much using contact mode. Uh, but uh, at times we do that, but for Advanced modes like PFM or conductive AFM, we need to do this contact mode imaging. Uh, the, the second mode was uh, uh, non-contact mode, okay? and uh, we, we found that you know this non-contact mode is going to preserve the tip sharpness and the sample surface, and we, we get high resolution images and we get more accurate results. Tapping mode, uh, you know, is an alternative to, to uh, non-contact mode as well, uh, where uh, the cantilever oscillates at a higher amplitude and it taps on to the sample surface, right? Uh, definitely, it produces some material contrast, but uh, eventually, uh, it, it might learn the tip uh, sharpness at a higher rate, resulting into the loss of uh, you know resolution. So this is what you know I wanted to discuss with you uh, today: uh, the basics of uh, you know uh, principle, basic principles of atomic force microscope. Thank you so much. Thank you.